sorts of useful information as to how you can help. Such little things as writing a card once a month. Uh, they'll direct you who to write to. Uh, there's all sorts of things that you can do. And yes, we are our brother's keeper. Pray with me. Father, we pray that in all things we would do well as you do well, as you do all things well. Lord, uh, for our veterans, we lift our prayer of comfort, our prayer of healing. We ask for peace in their souls while they spent their lives helping us to stay free, to bring peace. Now, Lord, give them peace inside. And help us to be part of that where we can. We lift our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. The scripture that Barbara read a little bit ago from Haggai, uh, the prophecy, this little known prophet, matter of fact, he's so little known, I looked back over my records to see, and frankly, I ran across it again, one of those spots by in 40 years of preaching, and I've never preached from Haggai. I don't know why, but... Um, when it came up in the lectionary, I thought, you know, I can't remember ever having preached from Haggai. I went back and looked, and certainly I haven't. And so, uh, from this text, one of the things that we learned is that in that day, in Haggai's day, Jerusalem was nothing but rubble. You ever watched a movie that opens on a scene where there's nothing but rubble, buildings are crumbled down, this was Jerusalem, the city, and Solomon's great temple had been destroyed by the Babylonians, by their armies in 586 B.C. And that's the time, roughly 600 years before Christ is born, and the building would not be started, the rebuilding would not be started for another 30 years from the time that Haggai actually wrote his prophecy. The survivors of the 70-year captivity, and Haggai was one of them, uh, they had been allowed to start returning home from Babylon. You remember what happens every time uh, we read in the Bible where uh, one nation conquers another, they take all the best, the most promising, the young, strong, the smartest, the talented folks, they take them and they put them into captivity, keep close watch on them, and they make use of them. Well, here it is, and it's been 70 years since... Uh, uh, Jerusalem is uh, destroyed, and some of the captors now, the survivors, Jerusalem, uh, 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 Jewish survivors, are returning back to Jerusalem. And they're, re they're coming back to their homeland, actually what was left of their homeland. And what greeted them was the rubble of Jerusalem's former glory. I got a sense of what people would face coming up on that scene. Uh, 70 years in captivity, most of them had been born in captivity who were returning home now, but some were still straggling in, hobbling in at 90, 95 years of age. And they look upon this scene of the rubble of Jerusalem's former glory. Think about that for just a moment. The temple, the great temple that Solomon built, now just in ruins, just rocks laying on the ground. The city walls broken down, the houses burned, everything just a mess. I got the sense of what they might have thought when I looked over my life in, in some ways. And one time in particular was many years ago when I attended a denominational conference in Pensacola, Florida. One of the afternoons where there was no meeting, generally they met for four days, and one of the afternoons there was no meetings at all, so I took a drive around the city to take in some of the local culture. And I was in a residential area, and as I pulled up to a traffic light, it was a red light, and I stopped there, I looked out the left side of the driver's side window, and there was a lot. It was residential, it was houses all on this side, and houses all on this side, and as I looked over here, I'm staring at an empty lot. It's an abandoned lot. It's, I mean, it's trash everywhere. And in the middle of the lot, right in the front, there are three steps. Steps to a front door. But there's no front door. Matter of fact, there's no house. It's just three steps 
sitting there. And on the steps, on each of the steps, there was written a single word with white paint. Somebody had taken the time to paint these words. And the words were these. And it started on the first step, went to the second step, third step. Chappie's first steps. What do you think it means? I haven't figured it out to this day what it means. But I'll tell you what went through my mind at the moment. I thought, well, who was Chappie? Was it a little child? And maybe about eight or ten months old or a year old, year and a half, taking his first step, Chappie's first steps. Or maybe, was Chappie a paralytic that was in a wheelchair? And suddenly, Chappie got a new lease on life, got healed in some way, got out of the wheelchair and was able to walk up those steps as the first steps. Or maybe it was a stray dog that wandered in and they named him Chappie. I don't know. Somebody, though. I mean, who or what Chappie was or is is something I've never found out, but it must have been something noteworthy in the day because somebody took time to commemorate Chappie's first steps. It looked like rubble, somebody's former glory. And the rubble of former glory is part of our human history and our wonderment. We wonder how such figures or empires as the, the Babylonians and the Egyptians, how could the Roman Empire and the Greco-Roman Empire, how could they all go out of business? I mean, whether they're leading the way for a few years or hundreds of years, even whole civilizations can evaporate into thin air. Think of the Incans of the 13th century. You can't find them anymore. Their glory just absolutely disappeared. Their glory days vanished. There's nothing that remains but the rubble of the ruins. For the descendants of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph, the promised land was now the plundered land. It was pulverized by the Babylonians. It was picked over and there was nothing worthwhile left. Only memories and crumbled walls stirred the fading memories of their kings like David and Solomon, the great judges like Deborah and Samson. Only a strong sense of history instilled in the culture brought back images of Moses and the Exodus with the presence of God leading the way, a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. There was the rubble of former glory and current despair for those who were coming back from Babylonian captivity. And so enter Haggai at this moment, about 530 BC. He's armed with a fresh message from Yahweh, a new word from above about hope for the future. And it changed the course of Israel's history. And I believe it speaks to us today as well. So what I want to do this morning is look at, and you've got five truths about the way God speaks the message for today's church from the prophet's message to Jerusalem. And this is where the roadmap begins. Truth number one is that in times of rubble, when everything is crumbled, God speaks to a faithful remnant. What's a remnant? It's what's left, right? It's what's left over. And in this case, God speaks to people who are the leftovers of a great civilization, the Jews in Jerusalem. And we begin with Haggai chapter 1, verse 15 at the end. Then on October 17th of that same year, the Lord sent another message through the prophet Haggai. Say this to Zerubbabel, son of Sheltiel, governor of Judah, and to Yeshua, son of Jehoshaphat, the high priest. And to the remnant, there it is, the remnant of God's people there in the land. Does anybody remember this house, this temple in its former splendor? How, in comparison, does it look to you now? It must seem like nothing at all. Is that a despairing reality that they had to face? That that great city, that great temple, all of that great civilization was now Nothing at all. But despairing reality, the returning captives face their world-class city, 
Their nation was in ruins, nothing but rubble and destruction. And amid the spider webs and the dry bones and the crumbled buildings, there was no hope, no glory, and certainly no future as they saw it. What could rebuild hope in the midst of such great devastation? These people had gone from hero to zero, so what words could heal them? The answer is in the first sentence of the text. The Lord sent another message. God was speaking to people who were still His. Through their national heritage and all of their history, and even though it was somewhat faded, they did have an unextinguishable faith. The Jews have always exhibited that. The only thing that could give them hope was a word from their God, and God does that, and God did that, and God still does that. God still speaks. Can we get an amen on that? Amen. amen. He still speaks today. Truth number two, in times of rubble, God speaks, not only does he speak to a faithful remnant, but he speaks words of strength. Notice verse four. Now the Lord says, be strong, Zerubbabel. Be strong, Yeshua, son of Jehoshadak, the high priest. Be strong, all you people still left in the land. God is speaking to a remnant. He's speaking words of strength to them. And if you notice this, God speaks to the politicians. He says, Zerubbabel, he was the governor. He says, uh, he speaks to the religious leaders, Yeshua, son of Jehoshadak, the high priest. So he's got the politicians, he's got the religious leaders, but what does he say next? He says, all you people still left in the land. He's speaking to every last inhabitant of the city in ruins. He says, be strong. You know, the Lord knows they were going to need the kind of strength that God could provide to rebuild what had been a great city, let alone if we are to borrow from our current day political ethos, uh, let alone making Jerusalem great again. <laughs> Man, just rebuilding the walls was going to be a tough thing. But to rebuild the greatness of Jerusalem? Come on, Russell. But yet, that's exactly what God is saying here. He's speaking words of strength to them. Be strong. When God speaks the words of strength to people who believe, not to people who say they believe, not to people who hope they believe, but to people who are willing to stake every bit of who they are, their future, their past, their present, on God, which is the definition of believing in God, then there's no room for timid backing off. That's when being strong is a reality. You know, the, if you remember in Exodus chapter 13, we read about the time when the children of Israel uh, were faced with the, the, the prospect of moving across Jordan to do what? To possess the promised land, right? Mm -hmm. That it was time for them to stop fooling around and get across that river and possess the land. What did they do? Well, uh, there were spies sent out. There were 12 of them sent across the Jordan to go and spy out the land, to go and check out and see what it was like and what they were going to face. Mm -hmm. And when the spies came back, all 12 of them came back, two of them said, we can do this. But 10 of them said what? Well, no. Oh, no, 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 no. Giants over there. We look, we look like grasshoppers in their sight. We go over there, we can get our clock cleaned. You know, that's a defeat. So who did the people believe? The team. They believe the majority report. My friends, what happened as a consequence, you know, is not a single adult in all the nation of Israel got any closer to the promised land than the wrong side of the Jordan River. The whole nation had to wander in circles in the wilderness for the next 40 years while all the unbelief died off. If that doesn't speak to the church today, we might as well pack up our Bibles and head for the bars. If the church is ever going to stand strong in a godless culture like that in which we live, it will not be with half-hearted faith or half-hearted effort. And that leads us to the next natural truth that God spoke today. Number three, in times of trouble, God speaks words of action. He doesn't tell us to settle in on our blessed assurance. He doesn't tell us to have ourselves affixed with superglue to the pew. 
What does he say in Haggai, Haggai chapter 2, verse 4? He says, and now get to work, for I am with you, says the Lord of heaven's army. Get to work, for I am with you. And he said it just like he said it to Moses. He said, I am is with you. God is with you. Here's a good question. I want you to think about this question for as long as it takes to answer this question. I want you to answer this question back. <coughs> Which is stronger? The whole earth filled with ungodly people or the armies of heaven of which the Lord is the commander? Which is more able? Which is stronger? Well, that's a no-brainer for us, isn't it? But do we act that way? As a church. As Christians, do we act that way? Truthfully, sometimes it seems to me that the church has grown fond of losing this spiritual battle and apologizing to the world for even trying. I wonder how long it would take for us to develop the courage to speak up a word of testimony for this world to choke on in its unbelief. We've been wallowing in our diminishing strength. This church and every church in America, it seems. We've been lacking elbow groups for decades. And is it any wonder that the church is weak and ineffective? And that's where the next word of God shows up that He spoke that day. In trouble, or in times of rubble, God speaks words of courage. I think we need a super infusion of that these days. We've, uh, we've got a little hound at home. Most of you know the name Gracie. Some of you have met Gracie. And uh, every day when I get up, one of the tasks that I have to do is stick a needle in that dog. I have to find a spot where she's still got a spot and stick a needle in there and hold it in there for the next half hour while she is hydrated with fluids. Didn't do that. Her kidneys would shut her down in, in short order of time. And so this is something that has been, I'm, now I'm not, I'm not looking for pity for Russell here. I'm trying to make a point that an infusion of fluid is what my dog needs every day. An infusion of courage is the only thing that's going to keep the church growing. Amen. The prophet speaking God's words reminds them of when their ancestors left the bondage of Egypt as slaves. They went out as free men, something that they'd never known before. 400 years of bondage in Egypt, all of them were born as slaves, save one. Guy by the name of Moses who led them. He was born to be a free man. He was a closet slave. But God said that his spirit was with them when they marched out of Egypt. He was reassuring them. He was encouraging them. He was speaking courage into their life. That he was still there. So it was okay to have a backbone and get busy doing God's bidding. Did you notice in those words of encouragement where God says, my spirit remains among you just as I promised. Did you notice that God said not a thing at all about temple buildings? He said not a thing at all about government offices that had been burned to the ground. Did you notice he mentioned nothing of armies or economies or trade deals or natural resources? Did you notice he didn't talk education? He didn't talk nuclear power? He didn't talk technology? He didn't talk advances or give a state of the union address directed to the right side of the aisle or the left side of the aisle? Did you notice that there's only one asset that God mentions in his encouragement to those people in the midst of the rubble upon which most nations put all the weight of their trust and their hope? The only asset that God mentioned is his spirit. The only asset. God's own Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost of Pentecost, and He who brooded over the waters of creation. How does Genesis start? And the Spirit of God brooded across the waters. It was God's Spirit that God used to bring the creation into existence in the first place. 
through Jesus Christ and his power. The Egyptian captives, released as the Jewish brand new nation, children of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, would need no trade deals, they would need no power brokers, they would need no brinksmanship with other nations and world leaders. Why? Because they had everything they needed. They had the Spirit of God, and so do we. And because that's so, we can be the people of courage. We can have a backbone and march for the Lord in this place. And there's a reason for all of that. That's the fifth thing that God said on that day. In times of rubble, God is still God. That's the point. It's hard to miss God's voice if you're listening. At the end of this text, God says this, I, the Lord of heaven's armies, have spoken. He's spoken. You know, when God says something, things happen. When God says something, that's all that needs to be. When God spoke, the sun came in the sky. When God spoke, the earth and the waters divided. When God spoke, the night was separated from the day. When God spoke, the animals came into existence. And when God spoke, He made a man. A man who would be like Him. When God spoke, things happen. <clears throat> But besides the words of God, notice what his hand does. There's two things that I want to point out here as we close this morning. First point is this. God is the God who's going to shake the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the nations. Look what it says in verses 6 and 7. For this is what the Lord of heaven's army says. This is what he says. In just a little while I will again shake the heavens and the earth. So he says he's going to do it, and he's going to do it. The oceans, the, the dry land. I will shake all the nations, and the treasures of all the nations will be brought to his temple. You know what this means? This means that the God who says is also going to do, and when he does, people are going to have to do. When God says what he is going to do, and then actually does what he says he's going to do, people have to do it what God says and what God wants them to do. What did he say there? The treasures of all the nations we brought to this temple of God. Talking about gold and silver? Well, yeah, to a degree. But that's not the main point, is it? The main point is that all of the allegiance of all of the earth will bow. What does the scripture say? Every knee shall bow, every tongue confess to the glory. That's the next part. We don't know if this is going to happen in our lifetime or if Christ is going to carry a bit longer. But as certain as the sun came up this morning, God's promises are going to be completed. Haggai is a foreshadow of the end times, much like most of the Old Testament is. Haggai is a hint of what Jesus was going to say outside Jerusalem when he preached that great Mount Olivet Discourse. I want to read to you from Matthew chapter 24. Listen to what Jesus said. And I have an idea that Jesus had a picture of Haggai in his mind when he was saying it. Listen, Jesus told them, Don't let anyone mislead you, for many will come in my name claiming I am the Messiah. They will deceive many, and you will hear wars and threats of wars, but don't panic. Yes, those things have to take place, but the end won't follow immediately. Nation will go to war against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in many parts of this world, but all this is only the first of the birth pains with more to come. Then you will be arrested, persecuted, and killed. How's that for a recruiting poster? <laughs> You'll be arrested and persecuted and killed. You'll be hated all over the world because you're my followers, and many will turn away from me and betray and hate each other, and many false prophets will appear and will deceive many people. Sin will be rampant everywhere, and the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. And the good news about the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world so that all nations will hear it. And then the end will come. God is going to shake every part of the universe before the end of the days actually comes. And so threats, injunctions, subpoenas, persecution, famines, none of that is going to deter God, the Lord of heaven's armies, from exacting judgment on the earth and all it holds. The end of time, as you and I, as you and I understand time, you know, 
this morning Ken has adjusted the clock, so, uh, so I'm going to keep you here for another week. Uh, as we understand time and eternity, all of that is in God's hand. And when God moves, time has to comply with what he wills. And here's what's going to happen finally. It's the last point I want to make. He's the God who not only, not only is going to shake the earth, and the heavens, and the seas, and the dry land, but he's the God who's going to fill his temple with glory. And the future, he's going to fill with peace. Verses 7 through 9 of our text this morning, let me read it and let it roll around in your, in your heart for just a few moments. God says this through Haggai. I will fill this place with glory, says the Lord of heaven's armies. The silver is mine, the gold is mine, says the Lord of heaven's armies. Those are the minor things. Here comes the major. The future glory of this temple will be greater than its past glory, says the Lord of heaven's armies. And in this place, I will bring peace. He says it again. I, the Lord of heaven's armies, have spoken. When God makes a promise, it's a full promise. And that means that he fulfills it. He fills it full. God's promise of peace and turning the rubble of former glory into the kind of peace and glory that have never been seen before is as certain as yesterday's sundown. This is what the Bible scholars call prophetic perfect. It's when the preacher or the prophet takes a future event, and he says, and he talks about it as if it's already happened. Prophetic, perfect, perfectly completed, prophecy completed. We have an old saying that I love, that when you're so certain of something that you know it's going to happen, you can say to somebody, when you tell them about it, you can take that to the bank, right? Why? Because we know that check is going to be cashed. We know the bank is going to honor that. We know the signature is real. God's hand on the throttle of time, eternity, and the affairs of humankind is so certain. There is no intelligent choice that any human being can ever make other than to comply and cooperate with courage and get to work and stay strong and stay faithful because we are His and He is God. And you can take that to the bank. That's prophetic perfect. Let's make a conclusion here with Haggai. In Haggai's day, the peace, the peace that God promised came, but it was temporary. And it was only a foreshadow, really, of the ultimate peace that God wanted to bring, but we have trouble accepting. We're going to be celebrating that, the beginning of that, uh, very shortly, the next few weeks, December the 1st, begins Advent. That's when the season changes from ordinary time to Advent, and the peace that God eventually brought was in the form of a child in a cow feeder in a place called Bethlehem. This child would be called the Prince of Peace. When God said, I will bring to this place peace, he was talking about his son. We managed to mess that one up. And as the season certainly will change from Lent, from, um, from Advent to Lent, um, we'll remember how we hung that Prince of Peace on the cross. But just like God did three days after Jesus died on the cross, he raised him from the tomb in a surprise that nobody expected, not even Jesus' closest friends. And just in that same way, on this side of the resurrection, we're looking forward to the next resurrection. And friends, we're not going to be able to mess that one up. When he comes, it will be final. It's going to be a victory that will never turn into former glory again. You don't want to miss that one. So if you haven't ever, give your life to Christ. But for now, Christian, look above the rubble. If you look around and you're looking at the rubble of former glory and you're thinking, how can this ever be? rebuilt, look above the road and get to work because your redemption